I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies and host of the IFS Zooms In. The IFS conducts independent, high-quality research into the key issues facing the government and society. If you enjoy our podcast and want to support the work we do, please consider setting up a monthly donation to the IFS. Even £5 a month helps us to fund projects like this podcast. You can find more information by visiting www.ifs.org.uk forward slash donate or in the episode description. Now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to this edition of the IFS Zooms In. I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and today I'm joined by Carl Emerson, Deputy Director here at the IFS, and I'm delighted to be joined by John Hutton, formerly a Cabinet Minister in the last Labour government. But more importantly for today's conversation, John was asked by David Cameron's government to look at public service pensions and indeed chaired the Public Service Pensions Commission, which reported about a decade ago now. As you may have guessed from that, today we're going to be talking about public service pensions. That is, the pensions that are paid to retired civil servants, teachers, nurses, doctors, police, and the armed forces, and so on. These are often in the news because they are significantly more generous and therefore more expensive than much that you can get nowadays in the private sector. So let, let's start just by getting a little bit of background on where we are with public service pensions, and then I'll come to the question of reform. So, Carl, do you want to start just by giving us a sense of how public and private sectors compare in terms of their pension arrangements? I think there's three main differences between the two sectors. The first is simply coverage. In the public sector, about 90% of employees are a member of their workplace pension scheme. In the private sector, it's about 75%. So in the public sector, it's a bit more common to be a member of the scheme on offer. The second difference is really about how the schemes operate. In the private sector, the vast, vast majority of schemes are what's known as defined contribution schemes. So by that, what we mean is we do a measure of how much money is going into the pot. And what an individual gets out at the end will depend on how successfully that money is invested and then how they draw that money down through their retirement. But in the public sector, it's quite different. What we do instead is we have a formula which tells people with more clarity what benefits they'll get from the scheme. So it's a defined benefit scheme. So the amount of pension you will get will depend on how many years you've been in the scheme and a measure of your earnings. And you'll get that much money every year through the rest of your life. So the benefits are defined. How much money that's going to cost the employer to provide is much more uncertain. And people often focus on that difference. But I think the really, really big difference is in terms of the generosity. The schemes that are available in the public sector are just much, much more generous than those that pretty much anyone can get in the private sector. So to give you one statistic on that, according to the Office for National Statistics, half of people who are in a public sector scheme are getting an employer contribution that's worth 20% of their salary or more. That's true of just 3% in the private sector. And I think it's worth saying there are some out there who would disagree with those numbers and say that actually that understates how generous the public sector schemes really are. So public sector schemes are much more generous than those in the private sector. But John, I think it's fair to say that um, when you were looking at this a bit more than a decade ago, they were even more generous than they are today. They were substantially more generous uh, 10 years ago than they are today. But I I think the fundamental challenge really with pension reform, I mean, you've got to try to make sure as many people as possible are saving for their retirement. You've got to make sure that the pensions they're saving in are valuable pensions so that will actually be able to sustain them during the course of their retirement, which, as we know, is much longer than anyone previously thought was, was going to be possible. And of course, in terms of the public sector, they've got to be sustainable over the over the longer term, because as Carla said, there's a lot of money being invested into these schemes. So that was the, the sort of context for my review. I didn't want my review to be a, a race to the bottom. It'd be very easy just to go in and say, right, we're just going to follow it. What's happened in pension policy in the last 20 years in the private sector? We could have done that. Although incidentally, of course, one of the consequences of doing that in the public sector schemes would have been a very substantial immediate hit to the Treasury, because the, most of these schemes are pay-as-you-go schemes. So if you say from some point in the future, that money has to be fun, put into funded schemes, you, you're probably going to create a £30 billion a year hit instantly for, for the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And I think really that is something that often some of the enthusiasts for what I would call a race to the bottom tend to sort of conveniently sort of skate over because there is one benefit in the pay-as-you-go schemes that um, predominate in the public sector in that the cash 
is used as you go along. I mean, quite literally, there isn't a fund into which these contributions are going. But clearly, and I made this clear 10 years ago when I published my report, that the path we were then on, I didn't believe was sustainable. I didn't think the risks and costs were fairly shared between taxpayers and scheme members. And I think if you're going to command any kind of public support for this investment in the terms and conditions of the public servants, you've really got to show the public, I think, that you're doing all you can to, to keep the costs in some reasonable sort of contained fashion. And so I think if you look at the schemes now that sort of came from my report, scheme members are paying much more. Their contributions are up by about 40%. It's quite a significant shift in the balance there between scheme members and taxpayers. There are still a, a significant cost to the taxpayer. But again, you know, when I was doing my report, I had to go around the country and I talked to a lot of people about it. And they say, well, obviously, we, we want the police to be looked after because they, they're keeping us safe. Oh, yeah, And we, we definitely want the nurses looked after because they do such a brilliant job. And yet, armed forces absolutely make sure those guys are, are fine too. And, you know, the, the political rhetoric about, well, we've got to cut pension costs, we've got to cut, cut, cut all of this it met the reality of, well, actually, no, that's not, not where, in my experience, a lot of taxpayers actually were. So my, my report really fairly quickly honed down on trying to find a way to keep these defined benefit schemes going in a more sustainable way in the future. And I think, you know, we, we don't know, I don't know for sure, I can't say now that, you know, this, these reform schemes are sustainable over the longer term. I don't know. I think we've got a better chance of making them sustainable. But still, it's entirely open to any government in the future to say, well, actually, no, we want another look at this because these costs haven't come down as quickly as we thought. And it is generally difficult in the current economic circumstances to look ahead 20, 30 years and say, well, we're pretty sure that's where these reform schemes are going to land in terms of their final cost. I think all of that is still open. It's still a bit fluid. I think we've got a better chance of making these reform schemes sustainable. But I, I wouldn't rule out, I think any government in the future is entitled to say, no, we want to have another look at this to make sure, we, you know, the things that we can control, we are controlling and the, the future burdens for the taxpayers aren't insurmountable. But I, I do say, Paul, that, you know, you, you've got to trade carefully in this space. I mean, I think at the moment there is quite serious difficulties in recruiting people to a lot of jobs that are vacant in the public sector. And pensions, in my view, have always played an important part in helping us to recruit some of the vital public servants that we need. So I think you've, you've, got to, you've got to tread carefully here. It's very easy to do the wrong thing, maybe for the right reasons, but in the process, make it very hard to run the high quality public services that we, we all want and expect to, to have on offer. Well, do you think there's a case for rebalancing, though, between pay and pensions? Because we know that pay in the public sector has come down even before taking account of what you're saying about increased pension contributions. And simple calculations suggest actually there are some groups in the public sector who will actually be better off after they retire than they were in work. If you're a low-paid NHS employee for a long period of time, add your state pension to your NHS pension, and you'll have probably a bit more in retirement than in work. So do you think there's actually a case for you know, being more direct about rewarding people for jobs in the public sector? I think there's a very strong case for, for government looking at how we can recruit and retain good quality people in the public services. And we don't really do enough of that, in my view. Uh, yes, there are statutory pay boards and all the rest of it. But we've never sat down, to my knowledge, and actually thought seriously about this balance between pay and pensions. You know, what what is the best way to recruit and retain, what is the best way to ensure people have reasonable standard of living? The only thing I would say, of course, is that if you take a sort of negative look at pensions, say, right, okay, we're going to shift some of the costs from pensions into pay or whatever. Remember, of course, once you retire, you've got very limited means of boosting and supporting your, your income over and above your pension. When you're in work, you have other options. You might be able to do other jobs or move career or whatever. But once you retire, all you've got pretty well is your pension. So I think by all means, have a look at this, and let, let's. Someone should do a proper piece of work around that, in my view. But I, w I would again, I'm a little bit cautious about saying, well, it's just a very easy thing. We can just move some of the money from the, the pension pot into into current wages. I, I think that needs careful thought. So, Carl, Carl, coming back to the structure or the generosity of the these schemes, two things that moved after John's report, I think the two big things, or possibly you could say three big things, one is that the pension age in these schemes rose from 60 to, on the whole state pension age, and the other is that instead of being based on final salaries for most of these schemes, the pension's now based on your average salary over your life. There's something else we might not want to talk about so much, which I think, think was particularly part of your report, John, which is that they, they go up every year in line with CPI inflation now rather than RPI. 
inflation. I mean, looking back now, Carl, what, what's the scale of those changes? And, and, and actually, what I mean, could, can you give us a sense of what is the generosity of these schemes, your average teacher or nurse or whichever other public servant you, you, you wish to explain? So before John's report, the normal pension age in many public sector schemes was 60. It was actually 65 for, for new entrants, but there'll be existing workers in those schemes who had a, a normal pension age of 60. And as a result of the reforms that was implemented, that was changed to be the state pension age. I think that People understate how big a change that is. It involves people having to pay in for more years to get the same pension for fewer years. And I think it's pretty coherent having the same normal pension age as state pension age. And it means as governments tackle more generally the challenges that come with a aging population with rising longevity at older ages, they may well naturally now be pushing up the state pension age, and that will automatically feed through into public sector workers having to work a bit longer if they want to get a full pension. So I think that's a very nice feature of the reforms, and I think it does really help to secure financial sustainability. The other big shift, as you say, was to move away from saying the pension is going to depend on a measure of your final salary to saying we're going to make the pension depend on how much you earned on average through your working life. And I think there's much justification for doing that. It's not clear why people who get a promotion towards the end of their career should get a bigger pension in respect for their service throughout their entire career. Something that the independent review that John led recommended was that your earnings in the past should be uprated by what's happening to average earnings overall. And the government didn't do that. Instead, they fixed it to be what's happening to inflation plus a set number. Now, the problem with that is that if you have then an experience where productivity growth really takes off and average earnings are growing very strongly, the schemes will be much, much more affordable. But of course, we haven't had that. We've had a decade in which productivity growth has really disappointed. With that, average earnings growth has really disappointed, which actually means that the way in which the government is revaluing these historic earnings at CPI plus, say, one and a half percent, really looks rather generous in, I think, unintended way. Mm, that's an interesting bit of unintended policy, isn't it? So the government was trying to be a bit meaner, I think, than, than John was suggesting by relating pensions to not the value of your earnings uprated by earnings over your working life, but uprated by a bit more than inflation. But it's turned out that actually earnings in the public sector have actually risen by less than inflation over the last decade. But in terms of pensions, it's going up much more quickly than inflation. But 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 pulling back again and, and, and looking at the, as it were, the sustainability of the system. Carl, you sometimes hear, one sometimes hears people say, look, the, the, these public sector pensions, they're just going to eat up more and more of national income over time. They're absurdly generous. Is, is that right? Are they sustainable? Is that is that overdoing the point? I, I think if we're looking at them from a public finance point of view and we just say, well, what share of national income are these pensions costing us? Well, it's about 2% of GDP at the moment on this pay-as-you-go basis that John mentioned. The projections um, suggest that actually that's going to fall over time. And it's going to fall over time essentially because I think public sector workers are having to pay in for more years to get the same pension out for fewer years. That increase in the normal pension age is a really big change. The change that the government made just prior to John's report starting when they moved from RPI indexation of payments to CPI indexation of payments. So that's a a, a better measure of inflation, but one that typically is lower, also saves them rather a lot of money. So you, in terms of pure financial terms, yes, we can afford these schemes if we want to. So it's completely wrong, isn't it? That those who say this is unaffordable, that you know, if, they, if they don't like them, that's not the route to go down because we afford them at the moment and they're not going to get any more expensive. Indeed, they might get a bit cheaper. It looks like they're going to get a bit cheaper. So they're affordable if we want them. I think the challenge really is about what is the best way to recruit, retain, look after the public sector workers that we want and need, and what is the right mix of pay what versus pensions versus other benefits, and getting that balance right. And if we have are providing pensions, making sure the balance between how much the employer is putting in and how much the employee member is putting in right is also critical. And I think actually you can see the government over the last few years making more effort when it's advertising these jobs to stress how valuable the pension really is, perhaps you know, maybe using them as a recruitment tool in a way that just wasn't the case previously. I think that's really the argument. Are they, are they the best way of getting the workers we want, or could we reconfigure the package in a way that perhaps would make public sector workers happier and also the taxpayer better off? And one of the changes that, of structure that's happened, partly because of this move to career average earnings being what determines your pensions rather than final salary is that 
I think it's fair to say that where we've ended up is a situation which actually for some public sector workers if, is if anything more generous than we used to have. And certainly it's it's tipped the playing field towards lifetime lower earners and away from the higher earning public sector workers. Absolutely. And I think that was really a question of final salary schemes, perhaps, as I mentioned earlier. I think, oddly, really rewarding people who get big promotions later on in their career because it gives them a bigger pension, not just for those years in which they were doing the more senior, higher paid role, but gives them a, a bigger pension for the respect of their entire career. So if you make it to head teacher, you're going to get a more generous pension in a final salary scheme, even for the years when you were working as a teacher, not as a head teacher. In a career average scheme, that's not the case. You take a measure of the earnings over their whole lifetime. So it means that high flyers, if you like, are not getting such a good deal. Low flyers can get a much better deal in these schemes. I, the other thing to note is this, this makes it much less like the private sector, actually, where there are a few people still able to get into final salary not schemes. Not many, though. And they really are high earners, typically, who are doing very, very well. So sort of middle earners in the public sector, if they were to go and work in the private sector, are really not going to get anything like this kind of pension arrangement. Mm. Yeah, I certainly know some um, retired senior civil servants who are really very comfortable. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, John, John, was that was that a, a part of your intention to sort of you know, shift the shift the playing field, as it were, away from the high earners and towards the low earners? Yes, it was. And that that design feature that Carl has just described about how final salary schemes, which the trades unions would always describe as the gold-plated schemes they wanted to defend, actually only served to to really benefit those at the very, very top who had this sudden career promotion towards the end of their working life. And those inflated pensions that those people were getting were paid for in the main by those who were not getting such generous pensions from those schemes. Uh, in other words, those on, on lower wages. And that that fundamental design feature of the final salary schemes, I was absolutely determined to try and remove because I regarded that as a flagrant in, injustice. But I think Carl's wider point, though, and it's something I wasn't tasked to look at, was this bigger debate, and we talked about it earlier, about what exactly is the role that pensions should or do play in recruiting and retaining people into some of these vital jobs. The thing that worries me at the moment about the, the, public, the state of public service pensions is this, that there's growing evidence that despite these reforms, or maybe because of these reforms, fewer people are paying into these pensions. And that is something we do need to, to keep an eye on, because there's a precious little point in having a scheme like this if you can't get as many people into it as you, as you possibly can. Because the whole purpose of this pension provision is to ensure decent standards of income in retirement. And if we can't do that through the pension process, we know what else we will have to do. Much more bureaucratic, much more... I think, less decent support that is available in the welfare state, which is much more intrusive, by the way, because it's quite heavily means tested and everything else. And I, I didn't really want that to be where we ended up either, because if you do end up in a situation where retirement income is substantially reduced because of you know lack of generosity or other reforms that you, you, you're making, you often passport those costs through to other parts of the welfare state and, and in an undignified way, in a way that a lot of older people find very difficult to handle. But I really do think this point about now taking stock of the role that pensions pay in recruiting and retaining people in the public sector is a very important one. But I think if I was the pensions minister or if I was still in government and in treasury, I'd be looking very carefully at the numbers now that are coming through that seems to suggest that people are opting out of, of joining these schemes in the, in the first place because that is going to cause significant problems if these people are not paying into a pension when they come to retirement. And there will be a significant cost to the taxpayer and all the bureaucracy that's involved in administering means tested or other welfare state benefits. And I guess that's part of the issue with providing a lot of public sector workers. But if you're a young public sector worker earning on you know £25,000 a year, you'd like to save up for a house. Your contribution to the pension may be relatively modest, but another 5% on your income may mean a lot more to you today than thinking about what your pension is going to be in 40 years' time. Yes, indeed. And I, I think that's something that you know, ministers should keep a very close eye on at the moment. Do we know much about how much there's going on of that kind, Carl? People actually opting out of public service pension schemes? We know that about 10% of public sector employees are not a member of their scheme. So we know that by doing that, they will have slightly higher take-home pay, but they're foregoing usually quite a considerable employer contribution. 
So I think it is right that we should be worrying about it. We tried to do some work to look at the housing issue and see whether there was evidence that it might be people who were sort of young public sector workers, perhaps really saving hard to get a deposit together. We found a little bit of evidence that maybe some higher earning public sector workers who were quite young were doing that, but it was it was pretty modest, to be honest. If If you look at this tilting of the playing field away from the high earners and towards the low earners. Is, is, is there any evidence that that's had a negative effect at the top end of the public sector labour market in terms of actually being able to, you know, recruit your head teachers or your judges or your senior civil servants? Well, I think we know that thinking about what's happened to public sector pay over the last decade, where on average public sector workers have not seen pay increases, often keep pace with inflation, let alone what we've seen in the private sector. We also know that those public sector pay awards were often tilted towards lower earners. So your lower earner not only potentially got a relatively good deal and perhaps absolutely a good deal out of the public service pension reforms, they were also often being spared the brunt of some of the pay restraint in the public sector. So I don't know that this is causing problems in recruitment and retention of higher earners in the public sector, but I I think it's worth noting that they've not only, perhaps for very, very good reasons, lost out from the pension reform, they've also experienced a decade where their pay has been squeezed by much more than the average. I'm not aware of any data that suggests that um, at the top ranks of the civil service or the judiciary, that there's a difficulty in recruiting and, and retaining people. I mean, these are very, very significant jobs, which come with all sorts of other benefits as well, prestige and public recognition and so on. But I do remember being very heavily lobbied by the uh, judges, mm-hmm. that under no circumstances would be I allowed to touch their, their pension scheme. But of course, for most of the judges, most of the judiciary, the career average scheme would have made practically zero difference because the, the salary f- structure is actually very flat. Now, there are obviously judges in the Supreme Court and so on who are paid more, but the vast majority of the um, the judiciary are, are paid p- within a very narrow salary band, and they are throughout their career on the bench. So I think a lot was made of the t- at the time that this would sort of make it very difficult. And don't you understand how difficult it is? These barristers are giving up their very lucrative practices to take on fixed salary jobs as judges. And which my response then and now is, well, yeah, but they had the opportunity, didn't they, for many years when they're earning millions of pounds a year to make proper pension provision. They can't now turn to the taxpayer and say, it's all your job now to make sure we can have the lifestyle we want in our final four or five years on the bench. That's not the deal. That is absolutely the opposite of what's fair and reasonable to the taxpayer. Absolutely. I mean, one, one shouldn't ever understate the lobbying power of judges. When I, I was actually in the Treasury in the 2000s, and one of my responsibilities was public sector pay and pensions, the only time I got a visit from another permanent secretary was was to talk about judges' pensions, or maybe it was judges' pay, I can't remember. It was certainly judges, and they, they, they seem to be the only group who could get a permanent secretary to come and lobby the Treasury on their behalf. It's, it's quite, a, quite a memorable experience going being summoned to the Royal Courts of Justice to appear before the master of the roles and the Lord Chief Justice to account for myself about what I was doing. I mean, it felt <laughs> very much... It felt terrifying. Well, it felt very much like a trial. I mean, it was done in the, in the, in the ch- most charming of ways. Um, but there was no doubt at all. I was being you know, thoroughly cross-examined uh, with a view to sort of being sentenced, sentenced in due court. Um, <laughs> but I, I think, with the exception of the judges' salaries, I mean, in the main, I'm glad to say that actually after my report was published and people had the chance to see the detail of it, it was, I think, it landed in a way which did make the, the, these reforms possible. I think at the beginning of my report, I think there was a lot of concern that actually I, I was going to do things that would have guaranteed you know, national industrial action and strikes that would have gone on perpetuity. And to be honest, Paul, I, I was mindful of that as well. But I started the review with a genuinely open mind. Is there a better way of doing it? And I think I noticed the other day that the um, pensions minister, bless him, I think he might have been one of the ones who resigned. I don't he know resigned and came straight back. He, oh, he's, oh, excellent. Well, actually, he's a very good minister. I'm glad he's back. But I, I noted that he was saying that he didn't think the pensions reforms in the public sector would survive the next 20 years or so. And it was very much part of the deal at the time when these pension schemes were changed that this was a 25-year settlement. Now, I think he's entirely in it, within his rights to say there's a better way of doing it. Um, I'm not entirely sure I, I would volunteer a better way of doing it, given all the other considerations you've got to keep in mind. However, since then, of course, the notion of collective defined contribution schemes has gathered quite a few supporters in the UK, and legislation has recently gone through Parliament to allow such schemes to be created. Now, 
the collective defined contribution scheme has essentially all of the characteristics of a defined contribution scheme in that there's no in final income or promise made to to the scheme member so you you don't know for sure what your pension is going to be but there's an attempt to link it to your earnings in the best way that is possible during the lifetime of those schemes now if you were going to think about an alternative i would start there um, I don't think they're as good as defined benefit schemes. Quite clearly, they're not DB schemes, but it's a sort of halfway house. It, they are complicated schemes to describe. And I think one of the beauties of def defined benefit schemes is the simplicity of them and the huge value as an employee of knowing pretty well all through your working life. If you stay in the scheme for a certain number of years, that's the pension you'll get. And that's My one regret about leaving the civil service is that I've lost that completely. Ah, but you, well, you have your accrued <laughs> rights, of course, from the time you're in. Years, oh, well. sadly. But it is a real benefit in, in, in pension scheme design. And I think it's one of the reasons why defined contribution schemes are, are not as attractive in many ways as defined benefit schemes. Because you never know. You just can't be sure what you'll get when you retire. And that lack of certainty and the comfort and peace of mind it brings it can haunt people all the way through their working lives. Absolutely. And, uh, and and the uncertainty and one of the things I think worries me about the state of pensions in the private sector, which is all, all done through defined contribution schemes, they may, they're may they not adequate on the whole, but equally it's the individual bearing all of the risk and they've got no idea really how much they're going to have at retirement. And indeed, they don't have to annuitize either. In fact, most people don't buy an annuity. So really, these are just savings pots, which people then have to manage for an unknown period of retirement, which may be five years, but maybe 25 years from the point to which they get to state pension. I think that that difference between the public and private sectors is, is, is much more stark, isn't it, Carl, than it was, say, 30 years ago. I mean, 30 years ago, quite a lot of private sector employees would have had an occupational defined benefit pension scheme similar to something in the public sector. And now they're pretty much dead. They are. And as you say, it's not just the fact that the private sector has moved almost entirely away from offering defined benefit arrangements. The defined contribution schemes that are now commonplace in the private sector aren't really defined contribution pension schemes. They're defined contribution savings pots. Once you get to retirement, you have to think about how to continue to invest that money, how to run it down. Clearly, if you're well-placed to do that around pension age, that's great. But you also have to worry about how, how well-placed you'll be able to do that in 10, 15, 20 years' time, right the way through your retirement. So there's a whole set of risks that individuals face about their ability to manage their money right through retirement, which I think in a defined benefit scheme or in a defined contribution scheme where you've bought an annuity – it's actually relatively simple. I mean, bluntly, you can basically spend all of your money that you get each month and you'll probably be fine. I think lots of people getting to retirement are going to find this a real challenge to manage. And then this is a challenge the people in the private sector are going to face, but those in the public sector aren't. John, coming back to you, the very first thing that you said, you said when you went, were going around the country and you were talking to people about the nurses and the police and the so on, people who spoke to you were saying, well, we need to look after those groups. I mean, in your report, I mean, it's noticeable there are a couple of groups who you single out, as it were, for special treatment in the sense that for the big groups of public sector workers, you said, well, let's move the pension age to the state pension age, which is 66 at the moment, 67 in a few years' time. But for the police and the firefighters and the armed forces, you recommended, I think, moving just to age 60. Can you take us through why you feel there are some groups who should be able to get a full pension seven years earlier than others? I think historically, both the police and the fire services have had those earlier retirement ages for their for their people. And that's, I think, a re largely a reflection of the particular nature of the work that they do and the trauma and the stress of those jobs. And I think I, I did look, and I seriously looked at whether we should say for all public service schemes, there should just be one retirement age, a common retirement age linked to the, the state pension age. And I think going into the final report, I had literally two versions of it. And I used to look at and read them and see if I, if I really... Morris like <laughs> well, I think you've got to look at what all of this actually could look like. And, and so I put the arguments in favor of having one pension age and a, another argument for having differentiated ages to reflect the nature of the work that people do, particularly essentially the uniform services. Because we, we do something else with people in those uniform services. It's not just the trauma and the risks that they run, but you know we ask them to necessarily put down their life to save us and others. And I think as a society, that's got to be reflected. That's got to be valued somewhere. 
in the system. Now, it's not reflected, in my view, in pay. Can we reflect it somewhere else? But, I mean, there were pension age, uh, retirement age increases for the uniform services. But I tried to reflect that unique contribution that the uniform services make in, in the life of the country in, in a way that I think um, was reasonable and fair. Now, it was my view. I mean, the government could quite easily have said, no, no, we're not going to do that, or we've got a different age in mind. But they did accept that. And I think all the opposition parties accepted that uh, as well as a, as a reasonable compromise, given that you know the, the fundamentals of all these schemes, which Carl has very, very well described, which is that you've got people probably not paying enough into these schemes and living for these all these extra years, those costs were all coming back to the taxpayer in one big sort of lump sum. And that had to change because that is, that's not, I, th I think, a reasonable sharing of costs between public servants and taxpayers. But I think this differentiated retirement age for the uniform services, as I say, was largely um, a, a reflection of the unique and special nature of the work that they do. Fair enough. We're coming to the end of this. I mean, in terms of when you survey the scene now, John, I mean, in terms of a lot of what was in your report was essentially taken up by um, government. I mean, do you feel, I mean, you, you've touched on this a couple of times, do you feel we are in a steady state, which actually it's best to leave well alone? Or do you think actually there is now scope for another tranche of reform? Well, remember, these schemes really have only been running for a few years now. My own sense is that I, I would give it a few more years before coming to any view. The government did legislate back in 2013 to restrict their absolute freedom of manoeuvre here. So Danny Alexander promised us, who was then the Chief Secretary of the Treasury who ran this negotiation, said these schemes shouldn't change for 25 years. And he legislated to really quite significantly restrict the freedom of, of manoeuvre of ministers to, to suddenly announce, we want to do something different, we're going to change this. It has to be quite extensive consultation before any substantial reform to the architecture of these schemes could be implemented. I, I don't detect, Paul, any political appetite to reopen the, 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 the work that I did. But it's entirely right for ministers at any time to say, well, no, I, our judgment is this isn't right. This has to be looked at again. But in which case, they need to tread carefully. I don't think they should rush into any sort of quick fix. There isn't a quick fix, by the way. But there are new options, collected fine contribution schemes. Those sorts of schemes are out there now, which really didn't exist in in, a, in the legal framework of pensions in the UK when I was doing my report. They, they do now. They have been legislated for. But as I say, there isn't a quick fix. And if you move to any kind of funded scheme in the, the big pay-as-you-go schemes, there's a huge instant hit for the chancellor. And I don't think there's a chancellor I've ever met who would willingly sign up to taking £30 billion worth of extra costs onto his budget. The chances of anyone deciding to double fund by um, uh, paying out of current taxes for current pensioners and uh, put it paying for future pensioners in a, in a fund, as you say, is pretty, it's pretty remote. It's pretty, it's pretty small. But I, So I think really you're only left with the two options you've got in any pension reform. You, you increase the contributions you ask people to pay or reduce the benefits under the scheme. There really isn't any other way to control and modify the costs of these schemes. And as you say, nothing quick here. I mean, it, it's, quite, it's quite something, isn't it, when you think about pensions. I mean, people who are joining the becoming teachers or nurses or civil servants at the moment, joining schemes which have been put together broadly in light of your report. It could well be you know, the end of this century that they are still deriving some pension, at least, from schemes which, to some extent, you design. I mean, you, you, your, your impact kind of runs across a century. Well, uh, because the other golden rule here, and you're absolutely right, is that you can only change future accruals. Everything you've earned and paid for up to up to that date is absolutely protected legally. So any savings that you're talking about, by their, by its very nature, they, they aren't going to show up for 20 or 30 years. Yeah, I mean, we see this. It's um, it's not so long since I think the last um, widow from the American Civil War died with a, with an American Civil War pension because uh, I think uh, some of these uh, veterans married very, very young women when they were in their 80s or 90s so that they could inherit their pension. So pensions do last an enormously long time. Um, Carl, last, uh, la last word from you. I mean, do, do you agree with John that we're, we're in a pretty much a steady state here or, or or do you think there is more more need for, for for changing some of these schemes well i think part of john's point was also about the the difficulty of doing reform here because you have to go about it carefully and there's lots of constraints put in the way for, for very good reasons i guess i do wonder whether the 
the current squeeze in particular through the cost of living crisis means that actually a deal that said, well, maybe employees could put in a little bit less and maybe get a little bit less out would be something that they would welcome. It might help get more people in the schemes. It would give them more income now in return for slightly lower pensions in the very long run. Of course, it would hit the exchequer now. So perhaps the the, the chancellor, whoever that will be in a few weeks time might not welcome it. But I do wonder if that kind of direction of reform would make sense. Although I admit it's probably not a very easy thing to pull off. But does it worry you from a labour market point of view that, that these things are so different between public and private sectors now? I don't think it does. I think actually in the, the public sector, you can ask the question, is the public sector employer or is the worker best placed to bear some of these risks? And I think the public sector employer in many cases is very, very well placed to bear these risks. In the private sector, I think you could ask the question, is the individual private sector employer well placed to bear those risks? And for many employers, in particular small or medium sized employers, they're just not well placed to bear risks about longevity trends over the next 80 years. So I think there are good reasons why the public sector might be interested in offering these schemes, because it might help them attract people in a very cost efficient way. And I think you know, the, the, the question that obviously raises, which we can't get into here, is how can we make things better in the private sector where so many people have got these minimal fine contribution savings pots and uh, really nothing like the level of pension provision that their parents may have uh, expected and certainly not what their peers in the public sector are getting. John, it looks like you want to come in for a final word. I just, I just want to really strongly agree with what Carlos just said. Uh, I think in terms of the public service schemes, I think he's outlined probably the only realistic, practical, short to medium term option. But I think you are absolutely right. The real problem with pensions in the UK is actually not public service pensions. It's the tens of millions of people who aren't saving anything at all, who or who aren't saving enough. So that's the focus, I think, that we should all have as a country about pensions reform, and not this hysteria that the right thing to do is to slash and burn the public service pensions. Brilliant. Well, that's a fantastic uh, note on which to end. I think uh, a number of things that strikes me have come clear from this conversation. The first is that it's just silly to say that we can't afford public service pensions. This is a choice that we can make and have decided to make. Secondly, public service pensions are much more generous than those in the private sector. But the thing we should probably be worrying about more is that the private sector pensions really aren't up to scratch. I think third, you know, the sort of really pleasing bit of this conversation really has been talking to John Hutton about how a fairly rational process for looking at this uh, at these schemes resulted in significant reform and a, a better balance of cost between taxpayer and public service workers. But I certainly take what both of you are saying. I'd be surprised if we get any substantial changes to these schemes for some time to come, not least in the face of the current cost of living crisis and the problems that uh, the governments may in any case be having with trades unions. These public service pensions are probably with us to stay for some considerable period. Well, thank you, um, everyone, for listening to this edition of the IFS Zooms In. Thank you particularly to John Hutton and to Carl Emerson. Please rate and share this episode. And to see more of our work, do visit www.ifs.org. UK. And if you do want to support us at the IFS further, please do consider becoming a supporter for as little as £5 a month. See you next time. Mm-hmm.